Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. We're going to go ahead and get started. Our speakers this morning are Dr. Nick Staub and Ms. Bree Anderson. I'm going to introduce Dr. Staub, and he'll introduce uh, Bree uh, as he's speaking. So Dr. Staub is a very familiar face here at Phoenix Children's. He's been a hospitalist in the Kids Link division since 2015. As many of you know, he took a job uh, a year ago. He's still active in Kids Link, but uh, he did uh, take a job with the Arizona Department of Health Services. He is the medical director at the uh, Bureau of Epidemiology and Disease Services uh, over at the state. Uh, he's going to be talking to us this morning on congenital syphilis. Dr. Staub is a native of Phoenix. He uh, completed medical school at USC Medical School, uh, uh, I'm sorry, school, Keck School of Medicine, apologize. And then he did his residency in pediatrics in Chicago at Oak Lawn. Please welcome Dr. Staub. Good morning. Um, I hope more people filter in. Um, so thank you, Micah. Uh, this is a topic uh, that ever since I went to my job at the state um, has consumed a fair amount of my time um, and taken me to kind of some far-flung uh, spots in the state, um, talking about the syphilis epidemic that we're experiencing, um, and then specifically the cases of congenital syphilis that we're seeing increasing as the outbreak changes its demographics. So um, I'm very excited to talk about this today. I harassed Micah for a couple of months uh, to get on the schedule. Um, so uh, this is uh, a timely subject and one that I think is really important for pediatricians in Arizona to know about. Um, I'm here today uh, with Bree Anderson. So Bree is uh, one of our syphilis epidemiologists, um, I guess our only syphilis epidemiologist um, at the state. Um, she is a CDC assignee uh, to us. Um, and then we also have, haven't come in yet, but I had invited um, uh, some of the Maricopa County uh, partners who are also uh, working on congenital syphilis to come this morning. So. Um, so this is uh, kind of the problem that we are having um, in the United States right now. Um, we are just seeing a huge increase in STDs across the board. Um, so these are 2018 uh, statistics uh, just out. Um, so we're seeing a 19% increase in cases of chlamydia, 63% increases uh, in gonorrhea, 71% increase in syphilis cases since 2014 and that has led to 1300 cases of syphilis of congenital syphilis um, since 2014 that's a 185 percent increase um, so across the country we know that this is a big deal um, here is just kind of another uh, demonstration of the rise in syphilis in newborns um, that's put out by the CDC. Um, and then there's that statistic there at the bottom that 80% um, is the chance of a mom with syphilis during her pregnancy passing uh, that infection on to the baby intrauterine. Um, so unfortunately here in Arizona, it doesn't, we aren't just part of the national um, outbreak, but we've been um, singled out as a special place on the map um, where our cases are especially high. Um, and so this is a, this is a nice uh, collection here of states. We're in good company, California, Texas, Louisiana, and Florida. Um, these five states account for 70% of the burden of the syphilis cases that we're seeing. Um, so certainly at the state of Arizona, um, it's gotten our attention. Um, and something that we've been spending a lot of time trying to put our head around how we can fix this. Um, here is just, uh, you can get all these fun maps um, on the CDC website if you have um, lots of time. Um, but it just kind of shows, you know, each state broken down. So even, you know, when you take everything that's going on in the U.S., you break that down to 70% in those five states, um, you know, uh, this big blue county here um, is particularly concerning, um, and we sit right in the middle of it right now. So should be on everyone's mind. So um, that's kind of national stuff drilled down to the state. So 
um, what's going on in Arizona. So this is just our general STD numbers from 2000 to 2018. So um, it uh, kind of looks like a, uh, the topography of a hike you might like to go on, but not, uh, the, not STDs. Um, here is, um, so I work with a lot of really great epidemiologists, people who are uh, really working to kind of put into pictures um, and graphs what we're seeing. Um, so these are just case rates uh, by county um, and looking at chlamydia, gonorrhea, and early syphilis um, and just kind of allowing you to see where we're seeing the burden of those uh, diseases in, across the state. Um, and so what we're trying to show is, sure, Maricopa gets a lot of attention because it's a lot of people. Um, and so the case counts are always high in Maricopa, uh, followed by Pima. Um, but what we're seeing is some of our rural jurisdictions having case rates that are just very high. Um, so that really is a challenge to us in terms of we can't just use our kind of more developed uh, medical systems um, in our major um, metropolitan areas, but we really have to look into our rural areas and try and think about how we can um, make a difference there. Um, so more just general STDs, um, incidents by gender and age, um, more common in women um, are chlamydia and gonorrhea, and then more common in men, um, traditionally syphilis um, and HIV, um, and then seeing co-infections in those uh, two populations in men. Um, ages 20 to 29 have the highest rates of STDs and incident HIV in the state. Um, and so this was our uh, kind of map of uh, STDs in Arizona, and so this is syphilis. Uh, so that's not a happy smile, that's a kind of a crooked smile, kind of like mine, um, but uh, not good. So um, again, this is looking at early syphilis 2012 to 2018, um, and there's your numbers to go along with your graph. Since 2012, um, in the state of Arizona, um, our early syphilis cases have risen 453%. Um, and of those five states, we're currently ranked number four um, in terms of the rate of syphilis. Traditionally, um, syphilis is a disease that's more common in men. Um, traditionally, um, in the community of men who have sex with men, um, it was much more common. And so uh, this is kind of how we've all thought of syphilis forever. Um, but again, as we look into more of our rural jurisdictions and as this uh, outbreak is changing, um, we're seeing as many as 50% of cases in females. Um, so this is just from 2015 to 2018, again, looking at the rise in rates um, and kind of as we, again, looking at more of our rural jurisdictions, um, getting a little shaded, shaded a little darker. Um, here's our gender ratio. So again, just as that ratio flips from um, males to females, again, uh, these are kind of outliers here because these are very small uh, population counties, um, but you can just see kind of Blur your eyes and you can see it. Um, and then, um, obviously, our uh, rates in infants. Um, so the major concern in that demographic switch and having more females um, affected, um, I always kind of flippantly say, I don't really care if adults get syphilis. Um, they can go get tested. They can be treated. It's fairly easily treated. Um, and we can, be, we can counsel them on how to avoid being reinfected. Um, that's great, but our problem is as those demographics switch is the females becoming infected um, and then increases in congenital syphilis. So these are our, um, these are our counts um, from 2014 to 18. Um, so again, you don't really have to blur your eyes to see that they're going up. Um, and then our um, case fatalities are also increasing. Um, again, these are uh, cases here, one, two, three, four, five plus. Um, so again, just showing um, as you go out um, where those cases are. They're not just in Maricopa County. They're not um, limited to our metropolitan areas. Um, they're in our rural areas as well. Um, so 2018, we knew we had a problem. Um, uh, 63 total cases of congenital syphilis, uh, including eight stillbirths and two infant deaths. In 2018, um, in September, um, as an agency, we declared 
uh, a syphilis outbreak, um, which allowed us to kind of change some of the traditional ways that we were um, recommending that pregnant women be screened for syphilis. Um, and then this is so far in 2019. Um, so we don't have a handle on it yet. Um, and Bree is still counting cases. She does it every day and lets me know. Um, but uh, we are definitely uh, still dealing with this and kind of in it deep. So the question is, where are the gaps in preventing congenital syphilis? Um, <clears throat> so we have noticed that 77% of moms um, who deliver babies with congenital syphilis um, have seen uh, a provider uh, 30 days prior to delivery. So again, when we uh, declared the outbreak, we kind of changed our recommendations in terms of screening for pregnant women. Um, and one of those recommendations is to screen pregnant women three times in pregnancy. So at their first um, prenatal visit um, in their, at the beginning of their third trimester and then again at delivery. If I got that wrong, I was gonna be in trouble. Um, so again, that, that late, um, we know that even moms who screen positive and are treated early in pregnancy, that there's a high likelihood in the setting of this um, outbreak that they become reinfected during pregnancy. Um, so if we're not getting that uh, second uh, screen in pregnancy, we're, we tend to uh, miss uh, a lot of these cases. Um, so a third of congenital syphilis cases in Arizona um, could have been prevented through third trimester uh, screening. So we're really trying to get this message out, um, try and talk to OB groups and make sure that we're um, following those recommendations. Okay. So I'm going to take a little bit of, I have a lot of slides here. Um, so... This, the next set is just kind of going back over syphilis. So maybe, um, I mean, I think everyone can kind of use a review of syphilis. We just don't see it that often. Um, so I might glance over some of these. This can be used as a resource if you ever want it. Um, but what I'm interested in getting to is at the end, we'll talk about um, kind of categorizing and treating congenital syphilis cases. So syphilis, spirochete, it's a really cool organism. It's a spiral. Looks like it should be at a party. Um, probably is at a party. Um, so just be wary. Um, so uh, divided into four surveillance stages, uh, primary, secondary, and then early, non-primary, non-secondary, and unknown duration or late syphilis. Um, so the important things about knowing um, those different stages is, um, is knowing what signs and symptoms to be looking for, and, and then treatment recommendations are different for each of those. So again, Primary syphilis is the first sign of the infection. Um, you can find spirochetes uh, on the bodies, in the bodies of these people. Um, so here's just a patch on the tongue. Um, apparently, if you were to swab that and throw it under um, dark field microscopy, you would see all sorts of those um, buggers. So they're there. Um, they are often um, on the penis and the vagina. A primary chancre of syphilis is a non-painful, non painless, uh, lesion um, and so unfortunately they often just go undetected um, and so um, whether it's oral, penile, uh, labial, they won't be, um, this is like their most highly infectious stage um, and they often don't know it so it doesn't make things very good from controlling an outbreak and, and intervention. Um, secondary syphilis is when a patient will often come to presentation because they recognize this rash, which really could be anything, um, notably the rash of syphilis involving the palms and soles. Um, and so that can be a giveaway, but otherwise the rash really isn't, um, other than they will notice that they have a rash. Um, again, they can have um, some more of these kind of mucus uh, patches uh, that can appear um, anywhere on the mucous membrane, so tongue. Um, as well, so you can kind of look for those. Um, and then they often have just kind of ill symptoms, right? So they can have flu, they can be feverish, uh, just not feel well. Um, the nice thing about secondary syphilis is there's a good number of symptoms that a patient may remember historically. So when you're going to try to stage them, uh, you want to find out when that secondary syphilis uh, stage occurred um, in order to kind of lock them down and what stage they're in. So again, you want to kind of say, did you have a period of febrile illness, rash, that kind of stuff? A patient might be able to remember that and say like, oh yeah, that happened a couple of weeks, a month ago. Um, 
So but then from secondary, you go into your early latent phase. So this, so all your symptoms go away, you feel totally fine. Uh, you can go along with life uh, doing nothing but just getting ready to spread your syphilis. Um, and then after a year's time after your infection, you go into what we um, call late latent. And that can persist um, for the rest of your life um, if you're never treated. Um, so we have a convenient syphilis staging flowchart. Um, this is available from your friends at the Arizona Department of Health Services if you wanted it. Um, all of these are available on the internet. Um, I can show you that. But essentially, you're going back to those signs and symptoms that are present during, um, during uh, primary and secondary uh, stages of infection. Um, Again, for primary, you're, ask, you're asking, do they have that painless, indurated, clean-based lesion, that primary chancre of syphilis? If yes, then that's primary syphilis. Um, if you're having signs and symptoms and there are any of those signs of secondary syphilis, so again, generalized rash, uh, you can have patchy alopecia, so hair loss, uh, those mucus patches, uh, if yes to any of that, then you have secondary syphilis. That's the easy part. Um, the difficult part for us, um, whether we're uh, diagnosing a primary or a person who's just coming to clinic or whether you're um, meeting a mom in clinic and trying to determine what uh, stage she is so that she can be treated before um, she passes the infection onto her baby, um, is again really looking at the past 12 months and seeing if they are able to give you any of this information. So if they've had a negative syphilis test um, in the past 12 months, and that makes them, that makes them early. Um, if they've had known contact to an early case in the last 12 months, again, early latent. Um, good history of those typical signs from secondary infection. A fourfold increase in titers. So again, we'll get in quickly to um, testing here, but when you're looking at a um, non-treponemal test like an RPR or a VDRL, you're looking for a fourfold increase in that titer um, to indicate a, an acute infection in the last year. Um, and then if your only possible exposure, which I can't really imagine anyone telling you that, but it's possible, uh, was in the last year, then that's early latent. All else goes into this bucket of unknown duration or late. So it's really easy. Uh, you can all figure that out. So the other um, difficult thing is um, you can go from an early latent infection um, back into secondary, so you can develop those secondary signs again. Um, that might be hard to distinguish, um, again, if, if somebody's been treated or not completely treated, but then redevelops signs or gets reinfected, things can get a little messy there. Um, and then from late, latent infection, you go into tertiary, um, which are kind of your late signs of syphilis infection. So this is what's uh, called a gummatous lesion um, of tertiary syphilis. Um, neurosyphilis classically is kind of thought of as a late um, sign of syphilis infection, but really can occur at any stage. Um, you can have meningitis, um, you can have ocular um, involvement, uh, otic, uh, hearing loss, tinnitus, um, and then your late clinical signs, and then obviously referring to the appropriate um, subspecialist if you develop any of those signs. Um, syphilis can affect every organ system in the body. Um, nothing is, uh, is off the list. Um, the other irritating thing for us from a congenital syphilis standpoint is transmission of syphilis can occur at any stage um, to the fetus. Um, so we know that during primary and secondary um, phases, you're, the mom is kind of most um, infectious, so we have the highest risk of transition, transmission. Um, but even during latent uh, stages of the disease, uh, mom can transmit the infection. So again, an opportunity to catch those moms um, who may not have any signs of infection, um, but be in a latent stage um, and get her treated to prevent transmission. Any questions? I think I'm doing okay. All right. Um, so those were the signs and symptoms of syphilis infections in um, adults. Um, what happens to babies? Um, so many of these babies um, are born um, low birth weight. Um, we see preterm deliveries um, and then also miscarriage and stillbirths. You saw those uh, reflected in our statistics. 
Um, but once the baby is born, they can either have no symptoms um, or um, blindness and deafness, uh, heart and liver problems, damaged skin, deformed bones, um, and then later in development have um, developmental issues and problems. Um, so again, kind of the hard part is when the baby's born, you are not necessarily going to see these things. Um, so you need to have an index of sus suspicion. Um, the mom needs to be able to report her history of syphilis um, and testing. Um, so there's a lot of areas where things could go missed. Um, prenatally, um, this can be diagnosed. Um, I don't think we see this often. Um, but you can see um, high drops on ultrasound um, and enlarged placenta. So this, a radiologist could tell me, is an enlarged placenta. Um, and then we can see some high drops, just some extra um, fluid there, um, hepatomegaly. Um, so these things have been noted on prenatal ultrasound, but again, not um, very common in what we've seen. Um, so early symptomatic congenital syphilis, again, prematurity, bone abnormalities seen in about 75 to 100%. So skeletal survey of these um, infants is an important part of their workup. Um, they can have just kind of general and large liver, um, elevated transaminases, jaundice, right? um, anemia, and thrombocytopenia seen on labs. Um, so some of the bony findings that you can see, um, just some general demineralization um, at metaphyses, um, periostitis and osteochondritis. So you can see the raggedness there. Um, kind of late uh, findings of some of those skeletal malformations. Um, and then some other um, possible findings in uh, early congenital syphilis, so lymphadenopathy, respiratory distress or pneumonitis. Um, rhinitis, so snuffles. Again, skin rash can be anything, um, and apparently some pancreatitis. But again, many infants may be completely asymptomatic, and you may not see any of these findings until uh, later in uh, infancy. Um, so snuffles, I feel like I've seen this picture like ever since I was a medical student. Um, but in a recent lecture I was at, I was reminded that babies, newborn babies aren't born with runny noses. Um, certainly they develop them, but um, if you were to see something like this, that's fairly classic for syphilis. Um, and again, I, if you take a sample of that snot, you would just find spirochetes. Um, so I mentioned alopecia as a finding for uh, um, in adults. Um, you can see kind of some patchy hair loss uh, as well in infants. This almost looked like, um, like a scalp electrode problem for that baby, but um, something to think about. And then Hutchison teeth or uh, teeth, dental uh, abnormalities, again, a late finding of congenital syphilis. Um, so again, back to the normal timeline. Importantly, transmission can happen to the fetus at any point. Um, so the stages at which um, an adult patient can transmit syphilis to another person or during the primary and secondary phases. Um, transmission to other sentient beings only occurs to the fetus during uh, latent stages. Uh, again, another thing that we can get for you if anyone is interested. Um, I think this is more um, relevant to adult providers, um, but again, just given um, the different stages that you can be in, um, you know, what are um, common symptoms um, that can be seen. Questions on that? No. Okay. Syphilis screening um, is very important to us uh, in our job in public health. Um, I think sometimes clinically um, not as important, but again, um, for syphilis, um, it's, it's been known as the great imitator. Again, we have these periods where there are no symptoms at all that can be very difficult um, to, uh, to assess. That's why screening is important. Um, and then, uh, again, in, in the, from the perspective of preventing congenital syphilis, you want to screen moms during these asymptomatic periods because, again, they can transmit to uh, the baby. And then, kind of back to my comment about I don't really care about a lot of these people. 
but what I care about is that they trace back to mom, right? Um, so I want to do partner services, reach out, find out who um, different contacts were um, so that we can appropriately screen them um, and get back to finding any possibly um, pregnant woman to make sure that she's uh, notified that she's had a positive partner um, and that she can be screened. Syphilis screening recommendations um, are here for everyone, but again, um, for pregnant women, it's that uh, the three um, points in time during pregnancy. And then um, this is some of the literature that we're trying to get out to practices um, to make sure that they know when those recommendations are. High-risk populations, I wanted to include this just because, um, you know, certainly as pediatricians, our uh, sexually active pediatric patients are at risk. Um, and so I think this is just an important list to look through and think about if you happen to be an adolescent clinic. Um, certainly, um, I, was, I was trying to take some of these off for our pediatric patients, but then I realized I really can't, except for maybe, oh, gotcha, in one second, I just thought this is a really interesting statistic. I don't, I forget where we found this out. It makes some people mad when we tell them that. But, um, apparently, if a, if a man um, requests a prescription for a drug to treat erectile dysfunction, that puts them at higher risk for syphilis. I think we can all imagine why, but I just think that's interesting that someone actually tested that. Yes? Yeah. And I, and I, should, I, should, get, I should get the reference for that because it comes up a lot. I forget who has it. Right. So uh, just developing erectile dysfunction can be a sign of historical STD infection, right? Um, so again, any history of previous STIs increases your risk for syphilis. Um, so we probably don't have a lot of pediatric patients asking for that, but um, everything else I think is fair game in pediatrics, unfortunately. Okay. Syphilis testing. Ugh, this drives me nuts. Um, but uh, there's a lot here. My formatting went a little crazy. Okay, um, so dark field microscopy is really cool. Nobody really has the ability to do this. It's not really done, um, but it is a cool way to try and find an infection. If you find a spirochete under dark field microscopy, that is a infection. Um, Serologic tests for syphilis, um, so come in two basic flavors, your non-treponemal and your treponemal tests. Um, so non-treponemal are your RPR and your VDRL. Um, so these are screening tests. Um, they are helpful to us because they are quantitative tests, so you get a titer, um, and we can use those, ti we can use serial titers um, to kind of better assess um, whether a patient has been treated, um, where that patient may be in infection, um, and then we can use RPRs to compare mom's titers and baby's titers to get a sense of whether a baby is truly infected or whether the baby just has, um, <clears throat> has a reactive test because of mom's history of um, syphilis. Um, so again, I have a quick uh, slide coming up here just to remind us how to use titers to look, um, look at these, but um, a fourfold rise in a titer is indicative of um, inadequate treatment or reinfection. Um, and then the drop in titer um, can be shown as an adequate response. Um, RPRs and VDRLs are great, but they can't be compared one to the other. Um, so once you pick one, it's helpful to stick to it. Um, and then it's important to know um, that there's something called ser uh, serofasting um, in patients. So even after treatment for syphilis, um, your RPR titer may come down significantly, but it may never completely go away. Um, and so um, this becomes an issue for Brie because some of our uh, moms who we see pregnancy after pregnancy being treated for syphilis um, are being treated for serofasting and not necessarily for a new infection. But again, sometimes that's hard to tell if you don't have a complete history. Um, so titers, again, two-fold change, four-fold change, don't care about two-fold changes. Um, four, four, four folds are significant going one way or the other. Um, so again, a four-fold increase can be indicative of a reinfection. So let's say mom was serofasting at one to eight, um, then all of a sudden had an RPR um, and is up to one to 32. That would be um, something to act upon. 
Um, again, 1 to 8 to 1 to 16, just a two-fold increase isn't necessarily um, uh, helpful, uh, when not something you would necessarily treat. Um, and then this is a good sign. A four-fold decrease means treatment has been successful. Um, and again, uh, she, he, whoever you're treating may just land there and stay there. All right, treponemal tests. Um, so these are specific to the bacterium um, and used generally for confirmation of the diagnosis. Um, again, these are only qualitative, not quantitative, so I can't get a titer on these. Um, once you are positive for this, you will likely be positive for the rest of your life, um, regardless of treatment. Um, so again, we can't use it to gauge treatment response. Um, there are two screening algorithms that I still haven't totally figured out why we do one or the other. Bree can tell us. But I don't really think it's uh, necessarily important for this crowd. Um, just know that there are two different um, algorithms and it's largely based on this is kind of like when you choose uh, your you know, screening cascade and the lab goes through the rest. Um, so unless a person already has a prior documented reactive treponemal test, the use of only one type is insufficient. Um, so again, using the RPR, or sorry, using a non-treponemal, so RPR, VDRL, in conjunction with a confirmatory test uh, is necessary. That's why um, using screening cascades is considered a best practice. Um, and again, we just kind of reflex down through that algorithm. That's all I have to say about testing. It can get more complicated and does. Um, all right, so I invited Bree here so um, you guys don't have to just listen to me and so that um, she can correct me when I say things incorrectly. Um, so I've asked her to do just a couple of the case investigations that she gets involved in. It kind of gives you guys a sense of um, what we do at the state, um, what we do in public health, um, and what Bree does very well. So I will turn it over to her. Sometimes I have to do this whole presentation, and I'm really glad I just get to do the fun part today. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a couple cases. I think one of them's at the end, and then we'll just break with this one here in the middle. Um, this first one that we're going to talk about, uh, so I guess I should tell you a little bit more about what I do at the state. Um, I get to review all of the syphilis-exposed infants every year. So last year that was about 200, give or take. They're still rolling in. We've got about 20. I think it's like 22 open still under investigation. And then we also get just quite a few more reports just as like data closeout keeps coming and people send us late labs or that kind of thing. Um, so with that, I get to see like all of the really cool cases, like where there's like some weird clinical stuff or like some weird um, stuff that went on with mom. Um, so I get to come in and talk about these. Um, so the first one that we're going to talk about today is our, it's very timely because we just talked about testing. Syphilis testing is not always very straightforward. Additionally, on that other handout, if we get in a little bit more into adult syphilis, um, there's periods of times where your adult testing is not going to be very spot on. So like early in your primary syphilis infection, you might have discordant lab results. You might have only one or two tests that are positive. And actually, if we go back, I'm going to skip back to this, but if we look at a lot of the time we run this um, quantitative RPR. I mean, let me start first by saying we don't really recommend either of these, um, one or the other, over the other. Um, they're, it's mostly based on like the population that you're screening. So if you're running an RPR first, it typically, um, the EIA and the CIA and the MFI are usually a little bit more, um, they'll come back positive earlier on in the infection. Um, but if you were also to run like a TPPA or an FTA um, or one of those other tests, then uh, they would not come back positive before the RPR would. So that's where kind of that difference comes into play. So this one that we're going to talk about today, this case, um, it's the most extreme example of late infection that during pregnancy that we have. So we see quite a few late infections. It's about 10% of our um, congenital syphilis cases. Mom tested negative at some point during her pregnancy. So whether that was her first trimester test third trimester, um, and then she then pops up positive at delivery or just too late in her pregnancy for us to be able to do anything about it. Um, something to note on these cases is these are real cases, and I've just changed the dates to just further protect patient privacy, but the timelines are consistent. 
So this one, um, a mom takes her four-month-year-old to the emergency room. Um, and her complaint for the baby was that the baby was fussy, appeared to be having some issue moving one of its arms. Um, when the CDI talked to the mom about this patient, um, she said that the patient in the, or the doctor in the ER mentioned something about hand, foot, and mouth disease. So that kind of gives you a picture of maybe what was going on with this baby. Um, so if we jump back to, oh, so I guess I should say some very smart doctor. I honestly don't know how sometimes we get the test and I'm just like, I'm so glad that they thought to test for syphilis, but also like, how did they think to test? Um, some very smart doctor just decided to test for it and the baby was positive. Um, so if we jump back to mom, she did have access to prenatal care. She accessed prenatal care late, which is something that we do see pretty frequently. Um, so she initiated prenatal care in December and she had a negative um, RPR at her first prenatal visit. She delivered the baby in February and she also had a negative RPR. Um, so when the four month old arrives at the emergency room in June, um, the baby gets tested, mom also gets tested and mom was also found to be positive. So as if syphilis wasn't, there was a couple things that could have been happening here. If syphilis wasn't complicated enough, sometimes you've got a, um, something that we call a prozone phenomenon, which is where um, mom's antibodies are so high that um, the test just looks like it comes back negative. We see it pretty frequently with like, I, I feel like it's around secondary or that early latent um, time period. So that could have been something that was going on with this baby. Um, also, like I mentioned, it could have been that mom was like incubating or just that RPR had not had a chance to come back positive yet. Um, I think that's everything that I wanted to cover on that one. Um, so lessons to be learned, there wasn't really a whole lot that we could have done about this case. I mean, syphilis tests are not perfect, um, but it really does speak to the fact that we just have so much syphilis here in Arizona, which is just so incredibly frustrating. Um, it does speak to the complexities of the reinfections and the late-term diagnoses. So like I mentioned, about 10% of our cases are those late-term diagnoses. And then also with reinfections, we see about 10 to 15% of our moms right now who get, um, re like they get tested and treated for syphilis and then before they deliver, they get reinfected and then we end up having to work at the baby. Um, so it just kind of goes back to screening and making sure that we can get it out of the community to protect these moms. So I have a couple of ID colleagues in the crowd. So for in terms of screening, so if we see a infant that we suspect, we would screen first with an RPR generally. Um, right. Um, okay, so uh, another transition here. Um, back to focus a little bit more on the baby. So you get a baby born and you think they might have syphilis. So what do you do? Um, so the general evaluation um, for an infant born to a seroreactive mom, so mom test positive, um, is to do that quantitative non-treponemal test. So again, the RPR, um, as we just noted, um, it's important not to use the cord blood um, as it may be contaminated with mom's blood. Um, and then to do a thorough physical exam looking for the signs that um, I have discussed. If you suspect congenital syphilis, um, additional testing um, to be done uh, would be a CSF analysis, CBC, again, we saw um, thrombocytopenia as a possibility, um, long bone radiographs, and then other exams as indicated. So just whatever your exam shows you, um, you may do additional um, testing. The amount of workup um, really depends on a scenario that's based on mom's syphilis history um, and her syphilis testing. Um, and so I'm going to go over that in the next couple slides here. Um, but then, so um, once you kind of decide where your infant patient lands um, in that scenario, um, treatment um, is derived from that, um, which can be uh, anywhere from 10 days of IV um, antibiotics to uh, a single shot in rare circumstances. Um, so this is the algorithm um, that we have developed at ADHS. Um, it's complicated and I feel like, I think Bree brought this to me like in my first couple of weeks and I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, 
So I, I looked at this over and I said, yeah, that looks good. Good job, Bree. Um, so now that I've understood it better, um, you know, it's, it's, I, can, I can at least take it apart. Um, so, and this is available, it's blown up at the back of your handout, um, but we actually have laminated um, cards of this um, that are available if uh, anyone wants kind of a bigger, easier to read um, copy. So category one um, would be proven or highly probable congenital syphilis. Um, these are infants who have abnormal physical exams consistent with congenital syphilis. Um, they have a RPR, non-treponemal titer, that is fourfold higher than mom. So again, if mom tests positive at delivery, you can then compare that RPR to babies. Um, and if it's fourfold higher in baby, then that's uh, an infection. Um, and then obviously, uh, if you have the ability to do, to do dark field um, and have a lesion um, to sample, you could do that. Um, these babies get 10 days of treatment. Correct me if I'm... Um, so again, um, this is proven or highly probable congenital syphilis here or here, um, and uh, on the back side, so also at the end of your handout, I have the back side of this chart, uh, which is your treatment options, depending on, so here where it says C reverse, you have those. Um, so category two is possible. Um, so possible is your light purple down here. Um, and it comes through this kind of complicated box. Um, so possible congenital syphilis, you really have to get a good maternal history, um, which I feel like is a good thing to talk to like the resident crew about. But um, you know, these are the questions that you need to ask mom if she's available in order to really kind of determine um, the risk factors for the baby. So maternal factors include not treated for syphilis, undocumented syphilis treatment, which let me tell you that is a lot, um, or inappropriately documented um, syphilis treatment. Um, so not correct, correctly treated for stage. Um, so again, I didn't really get into the treatment depending on those different stages, but um, those treatments uh, for mom or, or for adults can be anywhere from a single um, shot of bicillin to three injections, um, and so if they just didn't correctly stage them and treat them, then that um, could be a problem that would put this baby into a possible category. Um, initiated treatment less than 30 days prior to delivery, so not soon enough to prevent that infection. Um, maternal evidence or concern for reinfection. They received alternative treatment regimen during pregnancy, um, and the mother could have been re-exposed, including the mother's partner recently being diagnosed with syphilis. Um, so these are all the maternal factors in the setting of a baby with a normal physical exam um, and then that RPR that is less than that fourfold um, increase. Um, so again, so not slam dunk based on the baby alone. So then you ask the mom those factors. If any of those are true for mom, then that lands you impossible. Um, the workup recommended um, for this category would be an LP, CBC, um, long bone films. Um, if any part of the evaluation is abnormal or not been performed, the recommendation is for 10 days of antibiotic therapy. Um, if that evaluation is all normal and follow-up is certain, a single dose of um, bicillin may be given in place of 10 days. So again, I think this would largely be a decision that you would make in consultation with, um, with the, your ID team um, because I think that that is debatable whether or not that would be appropriate. Um, and then, of course, you could skip the, your entire workup and just give the antibiotics, but that wouldn't be any fun, so don't do that. Um, all right, so the last uh, category to go over is congenital syphilis less likely. So that's good for uh, people, babies. Um, so again, this is a baby with a normal physical exam and that RPR less than a fourfold, uh, less than fourfold above moms. Um, this would be a mom who was treated during pregnancy, but treatment and treatment was appropriate, and it was administered more than four weeks prior to delivery. So everyone did their job right there. Um, and then there's no evidence of reinfection or relapse. Um, so this is a case where um, 
the recommendation would be no further evaluation, um, but a single dose of antibiotics could be given. Um, again, just this is kind of a provider dependent um, issue, so I don't know how you would guys would feel about giving them a single dose or not, or whether you would just follow this baby with serial um, RPRs. Which usually not, so <laughs> just give them the shot and let them go. All right. Um, <laughs> that's good. We like that. Uh, and then, uh, sorry, one more. So congenital syphilis, unlikely. Um, so again, this is a mom who's treated correctly for uh, stage. Uh, the baby has a totally normal exam. Um, they were, um, and so again, no further uh, evaluation needed, but again, based on your sense, I mean, you considered congenital syphilis in this baby for some reason, so maybe you have reason to think that maybe they should just get um, a shot before you let them go on their way. Again, this is the last uh, page here. Um, that gives treatment recommendations. So generally, um, uh, penicillin G, um, 10 days IV is what we generally uh, recommend. Um, and then Bree has another case investigation. Yeah. Um, and this is a reportable condition to public health. So we should have the records for that. Again, not always perfect, but we can get them. We do. I'm sorry, I talk so fast when I get even a little bit nervous. Um, so like Nick, sorry, Dr. Stobbs said, um, syphilis is a reportable condition here in the state of Arizona. Um, chlamydia gonorrhea are also reportable, but with like a sheer volume of cases, they don't really get a lot of follow-up in Maricopa County. Some of our smaller counties still do follow up on them and ensure um, that they were treated and might even elicit partners. Um, but syphilis in pregnant women or women of unknown pregnancy status is the highest priority for follow-up. Um, that being said, sometimes these women are very hard to get in contact with, um, but we have a lot of really good people that are just very good at finding people. Um, it's kind of scary sometimes. So in the state, we have a state surveillance database that's called PRISM. Um, and it's a person-based system. So if somebody is diagnosed with chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV, we will be able to see all of that within their record. Um, and it doesn't matter where those came from as long as it was within the state. Additionally, the thing that's most interesting with that about syphilis is that um, we have a history of how their titers have fallen. So say that they go to clinic A and they get their blood drawn and then they get treated at clinic B and clinic C. Um, especially since the CDIs are doing such a high volume of follow-up with these cases, that information is pretty reliable. Um, additionally, we're able to see where the clinic, like which clinic the treatment was given. So like if they, you know, had tests done here and treatment given here, um, even if like you want to double check with that provider, um, like if they got three different shots, then you would be able to do that. 
Um, I will say historically, we used to have it um, be an option where they could just enter three doses at one week intervals. And like you say, a lot of the time they didn't follow up for doses two and three. Um, but now we actually make sure that they validate that they actually were given those doses. Um, so we have all of that information available and you can get it from calling your local health department. You can call me too, but we have to get a fax request at the state, which like I feel like slows things down. And also, I'm almost never at my desk anymore, um, which is kind of a problem. Um, so what else did I wanted to touch on? Um, we... Yes, of where they live. Just to be clear, Maricopa County won't have the records of the hospital. They would. Maricopa. Mm -hmm. So you can search them. So you can call. I can give you Rachel Howard's number. Um, I, didn't, I didn't put it on this slide, um, but I have it written down. I can, if you want it right now, let me find it. Um, her, yes. Interstate, ooh, that's my favorite question. Um, so those records take a little bit longer to get, but we do have an ICCR clerk at the State Health Department that coordinates with other states. I will say that you can call me and I can call other states and get the information that you need. Um, because sometimes if you put in like a fax request or it comes in through the county health department, just because like there's a lot of like it goes from the county to the state to the other state and then like back and then those records have to be sorted and then like back upload. And so that'll take like two weeks, which like the baby's done with treatment at that point and it's not very relevant. Um, so yeah, I think my contact information is on one of these slides. Um, but for like in Maricopa County, your point of contact right now is Rachel Howard. Um, if you can't get a hold of her, call me. Um, but her phone number is 602-506. 5435. 602-506-5435. I apologize for not putting that on a slide. I was thinking about it last night and I was like, should have wrote that down. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. 506-5435. Uh, and she's great. Um, we are also doing very, I'm going to talk, I guess, a little quicker. Um, we're doing very active um, surveillance on these cases. So we um, cross-match our database back into vital records. So if we don't get a test on the baby, then we get notified that way that we need to follow up. Additionally, we do the same thing with the fetal um, demise database. And then we also have some codes that run that say, hey, like this woman should have definitely given birth by now. Somebody needs to go and try and find the baby. Um, does anybody else have any other questions about that? I think I touched, go ahead. So other siblings, yes. I mean, they would rule. So this is, you know, this is something that sometimes keeps me up at night. So if they can find mom's last negative RPR, so say that she's in prenatal care, or say that with the last baby she had a negative test at delivery, um, the CDI will go after that information and they will document it. So if the mom had a negative um, RPR at delivery of that last baby, then they're not going to go after that previous kid. Um, if they can't find it, then they're going to recommend that the baby get an RPR. I can't tell you how many times we've made that recommendation and like people just haven't followed up, um, which is kind of unfortunate, but yes, that would be part of the recommendation is just making sure that mom was either tested previously and that you don't have to worry about the previous kid or something like that. Other questions? We might just kind of glaze over this one. Um, so this one I've called Public Health to the Rescue because it just kind of highlights the work that we do um, that kind of um, goes along with the work that you guys do. So with this case, mom tested positive for late latent syphilis um, back in January. RPR was a 1 to 128. Can't stage on titer. 
probably not a late, late case, which is just, you know, it is what it is. Um, she was 20 weeks pregnant at this time. So she, the clinic that she was at actually um, did an in-house RPR and they initiated treatment same day, which was great. Well, unfortunately, mom, like many of our moms, had some barriers to completing treatment. So she, um, after a lot of hounding from public health, she reinitiates treatment in March because she never finished follow-up for the initial January um, treatment. Unfortunately, same barriers are still in place. She never gets treated completely. Um, she restarts in May again, so we've had her for five months. Could have hopefully prevented it at this point. She's had three doses, but we like them at seven day intervals, not like one month intervals. So anyways, um, unfortunately this time we didn't have enough time to prevent this case because um, she delivers the baby. And um, the hospital, this is something that I hope is, I feel like it's less applicable in Maricopa County, but it is applicable here because you guys are seeing babies. I know that some of the babies get transferred somewhere in Maricopa County when they're coming from rural areas. So many of our rural providers don't know anything about syphilis, they've never seen it before. This hospital essentially was just like, baby's titer's fourfold lower than mom's, so like, let's just discharge the baby. Um, baby got discharged with foster care, and they were never notified that she had had a positive test or like that they should do any kind of follow-up. Um, so thankfully we got a test result on this baby and we didn't have to find it later. Um, unfortunately the test result was sent out of state so there was a little bit of a delay in getting that to us. But within 24 hours after we got the test result, the CEI calls the foster parents, um, the baby's transported to the clinical hospital, um, the baby ends up having a positive long bone x-rays um, and the baby gets 10 days of treatment. Um, so yeah. Um, so much of my job is just spent trying to get the baby to the hospital. And I'm just so very thankful that all of you, with all of your clinical expertise, take it from there. So, thanks. Um, and then this is just a reminder about maternal testing and treatment. And there's my contact information. If you can't get a hold of Rachel, you can call me. Or you can call Nick. And that's our general STD line. So there's a couple other people in our office that are, um, they can look up information. And then if you have any like non-urgent questions, you can send us an email at std at azdhs.gov, which also comes to me. <laughs> it depends on which lab it is. So if you've got LabCorp and Orquest, it's pretty good. It's really good. Uh, hospital labs, it depends on which hospital it is. So that's kind of like the, you know, sometimes we get some that are running in-house labs that like we don't get record of. So like the one that I was talking about, we know that she, like in reviewing medical records, we know that she had a positive RPR, but it was never reported to us. Um, so that is something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if they, yeah, I don't, with chlamydia and gonorrhea, I don't think it gets reported very often. It's just like, nobody really cares anymore. But with syphilis, I mean, I feel like if they don't report it, like a lot of docs are freaked out, like freaked out enough about it that they like call and they're like, I'm going to get this result. What do I do with it? But there's also... I mean, I have a list of hospitals. <laughs> this is going to sound bad, but I have a list of hospitals that I just know are not the best um, at reporting. Yeah, so we, well, that's kind of an estimate. So that would be the ones that we would count truly exposed. So if we go back to, like if mom has a, um, a serofast titer um, and she was previously treated before um, becoming pregnant with this child, we would not count that child as syphilis exposed and we would not follow up um, as long as she was adequately treated. So seven days apart on that one. But yeah, most of them in Maricopa County, so like <laughs> you're probably seeing most of them. And you're getting, I know that like, because if it's outside, like in the rural jurisdictions, I get to do a lot of the follow-up just because everyone's like, what? I don't know. Um, just because they're complicated. Um, so I think you guys do see a lot of them. If, I mean, if any of you, so there's going to be a big push here. There is 
to kind of try to figure out what we can do to better fulfill in some of these gaps, but then we would be able to do the volume. Well, the other question would be, what is the dimension HIV gets funded separately. And They, they do have a spending cap on other STIs, I will say. So I guess we're not currently counting on any of that coming to us. But we... I don't know. I don't know. And I we don't know. Last I've heard, we still haven't exactly heard what that, uh, what that plan is tied to in terms of funding. Um, and then, I mean, I know... I know, um, so Hep C, like, so right now we're planning a, a microelimination project with hepatitis C in our patients who are um, HIV infected. Um, so I know that's, so I think there's a, I think there's momentum to try and take advantage of HIV funding um, to cover some of the other infections, certainly here, um, it would make sense to, to build that. The problem is we don't have Good. We'll stick around for a few more minutes. Let everybody go. Thank you guys very much.